You are listening to The Next Play Podcast, the playbook for high-performing leaders who want to exceed their full potential. From walking on the Ole Miss football team at 5'7", 150 pounds, and earning a full D1 scholarship, to coaching thousands around the world and working with massive organizations like IBM, I've learned countless lessons that I'll be sharing right here with you. Join me as I interview some of the most successful people so you too can learn how to focus on always moving forward by deciding, planning, and executing on the next play relentlessly. This is Richie Contartesi with the Next Play Podcast, and today we have a very special and interesting guest, someone I'm really excited to talk to and dive into exactly what she's doing and how she's doing it, uh, by the name of Kim Daly, somebody who has 20 years helping people achieve financial freedom through franchise opportunities. Her skill for matching a client's background, interests, skills, finances, and life goals to the ideal opportunity has has made her one of the top franchise consultants in the country. Today, we are here to gain insights into what can seem like a daunting process, deciding on the perfect franchise to enable you to gain financial freedom. So franchising, licensing, all these different options, starting your own business from scratch. But I got to ask you, Kim, why franchising and how did you get into Uh, why franchising but before before that hold on let me let me just talk about you for a second why 20 years what how did you get into franchising and now how did you get into helping people with franchising okay love it richie and thank you for having me as a guest today on your show Yes, yes so like in our industry we often will ask the question like how did franchising find you because nobody really wakes up and goes oh yeah my dream is to be in franchise subway <laughs> or like we we find ourselves at some fork in the road or looking for something that we're not doing in other investments and we end up in franchising and I was actually super young on my way to medical school I answered a classified ad shows my age in the newspaper for a franchise consulting company, not the company I'm part of today. And I literally, it changed, it, I thought it changed the whole direction of my life because growing up, I there was two things I wanted to be, Richie. I wanted to be a motivational speaker, but like, nice. how does one do that, right. right? And so more practically, I wanted to help people. I wanted to influence people. I wanted to be, you know, directly in, in impacting lives. So, okay, I'm going to go to medical school and be a doctor. So I was a straight A kid. So I thought I was on the path to med school. And then look at me, I ended up in a role where I'm influencing people, helping people, motivating people, changing people's lives. It's kind of funny how life works out. So yeah. that classified ad uh, deviated me from what I thought was going to be my life path, but it took yeah. me right to what I think I was always destined for. So I've been an entrepreneur since I was 25 years old because after I did that job for three years and really learned about franchising, I did what everybody does. I broke off and became an entrepreneur. And I said, I can do this on my own. I don't need a franchise. Right. And then after five years of that, realized, you know what? There's something magical to being in business for yourself and not by yourself, partnered with people who you're working out the day-to-day problems with, you know, just being supported by um, other people that are in the same business because entrepreneurship is super lonely. And so I made my way back to franchising when I was 29 and I have been here ever since. So you can do the math and figure out how old I am. (laughs) <laughs> right. But you, I have to say for all the people watching, you do not look old at all. And I'm not saying that to try to flatter you like you don't. So Thank good you. for you. Because when you first said in the beginning, when you were saying that you lived out here in Vegas too, I was like, she doesn't look very old. So hey, good for you. And I'm, I'm literally not trying. Like, I'm not Thank trying to flatter you. Thank you. It's all that good, healthy living. Let's point I'm out the obvious. My degree. I, I'm a holistic Dude. girl. I work out six days a week. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. All right, so so let's jump into the financing thing because I or not the financing thing, the franchising because you know business owner myself, like I, I think there's a lot to consider with the franchise, the the proven systems and processes and marketing and like you said, the community um, are all things that man make life way easier. Um, you know why why franchise? Like why do you what what? who's the perfect fit for franchising and who's maybe not. Right. So 
um, first of all, let's go back to what I think you were going to ask is like, why a franchise? So just okay, to there summarize, we go. like sure. why I get so passionate about helping people. So like I said, most people who find me are in some looking for diversification in their real, real estate portfolio for whatever reasons, a recession or just economy, the market's too high or just enough money invested there. Or they're W-2 employees who fear getting laid off, have been laid off, or just looking for more passion, more control, more freedom. And so they come to the idea of a franchise. So the franchise allows the average person with no prior business experience to become a successful business owner. You're not trying to create anything. You're taking systems that have already been created and proven and tried and true, you know, are tried and true. And you're partnering yourself with people that can train and support you and teach you. So you don't need, not only do you not need business experience, you don't even need experience in the specific business that you're looking at, right? If you love fitness, but you've never been in the fitness business, it doesn't matter. You could go on to become the most successful fitness franchisee. So it's not about that. It's about executing on plans. And then, you know, whatever the leadership skill is that's required by the owner to drive that business forward. So that's why I love it because the average person can come to this and you don't need millions of dollars. You don't have to have experience. You're not out there on your own. You're partnering yourself with people who are helping you buy down the learning curve of starting a business and who are going to be there to train you and coach you and support you all the way through as your life for your life as a franchisee. So what, so, but you're saying as an investment option, so people, but so a couple of things there that you still have to hire people, right? Don't you still have to be in charge of like hiring and stuff oh, like sure. that for the franchise itself? So, so can, are you saying that you can be an inactive owner or when you're a franchise owner, you have to come in and say, I'm going to be the CEO. This is my franchise. I'm, you know, I like, you have to actually be very active in it. Yeah, a really great question. So there are different levels of investment for different investors. So some investments are what we call semi-absentee. I won't say that a franchise will ever be absentee, like buying a piece of land would be as an investment, right? right? right. A business. But even that, leader. you still have, yeah, you might hire like property management, but there's still definitely some, some focus. Yeah, totally. I mean, there are businesses, super, super simple businesses like a laundromat, not a super overly complicated business. It's going to be a bigger investment of money, but a lower investment of owner time commitment. Um, and then, you know, but then there are other businesses that are lower investments of money, but they're going to be bigger investment of owner time commitment. So I when see. people come to me, Richie, it's more about me getting to understand what are your goals? Why are you thinking about a franchise? What do you want? What do you want to create personally, professionally, and financially in your future? And what role does the franchise business play in helping you get from here to there? So I'm spending a lot of time like up front consulting, learning, getting educated, all the while educating about the value proposition of a franchise and what you're actually doing when you say yes to a franchise. So then I serve up the top three to five options that I think match the characteristics that the candidate is looking for and that have open territory and that fit within the, the financial realm of what the person can afford to invest in. And then I coach the process so that, you know, you're asking the right questions. You're talking to the right people. You, you know, how do we get through the legal documents or how do I finance my franchise? I am the resource for all of those questions and so many more. Like, I look at myself really as the mindset coach to how to invest in a business because so many people, Richie, have so much head trash about franchising. <laughs> it's really the purpose of my YouTube channel. I stand on my soapbox and try to preach to people like most of the things that people worry about never happen. Most of the things that people trip like what? over. What do people worry like, about? Yeah. Without, when people don't have someone like me, they, they make bigger issues out of things in the franchise disclosure document, or they, there's just all kinds of places where people go without someone like me to help guide their thinking about what's real and what's not. So that's what I do. And I do it all for free. What are, I love that. So what are, really? How do you do that? Right. You're like, what? It's like, it's <laughs> <not> the bomb. <laughs> is it, is, there has to be some sort of like, I mean- how does that work? You don't think I work for free, Richie? No. 
<laughs> I'm not like Saint Kim. <laughs> is it is it like you help them and then and then you you work with the franchises that give you like some sort of like you know, kickback or something for exactly. I'm, okay. play, I'm played okay. like a, re- I'm, I'm paid like a recruiter. So it's totally. I love that though. You. Yeah. 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 So, so listen, so the franchisors, imagine if you're a franchisor and you have the newest, sexiest brand, right? Every day you come in, there's like hundreds of organic leads. You're like, who's really serious? Who's financially qualified? Who, you know, who's going to pick up the phone when I call them? Like, that's just a nightmare. And so instead of doing that, they come to consultants and say, you go find the people, you pre-qualify them, you match them to what uh, we're looking for in an ideal candidate and make sure the territory is open and viable and then bring them to us all packaged up. And that's why they pay me. For sure. Do you do that with licensing too or just franchising? Uh, I am strict to franchising. So licensing is different. So the franchising industry is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. So regulated. It's insane. Licensing is is very late, much easier. So it's looser, but from the candidate's perspective, franchising is safer because of all the regulation, because the government's requiring the franchisor to disclose so much information, right? That in a license, you may not be smart enough to ask, or you may feel like it's not relevant. And then you get in and you realize, oh, shoot, I didn't ask enough questions or I didn't, I didn't really have the full story. Mm, I see. Okay. No, that makes sense. All right. So, so what are some of the things that, you know, make a franchise? I, I like deeper things outside of like, you know, that the, there's the processes and stuff like that. Like, how does it work if, if you're saying, Hey, I want to, I might be interested in a franchise because I don't feel like going the route of starting my own business from scratch. Like what are some of the key things that, you know, are the value, right? I guess the the real value proposition. Okay. So I want to know really, again, what are you trying to achieve through the business? What kind of owner do you want to be? Let's just say I want to be an active owner and let's start there. I want to be an active owner. Like I want to be an active owner and I want to, um, yeah, I want to start so, a franchise, but I want to be the best. I want to own like 50 of them eventually. And can you really make good money though? Cause you have to give a lot back and everything else. I love it. Okay. So here, there's way too many questions. So you, you need to be a candidate. I know, I know. I need to, ready. seriously. So let's play it like that. So, okay, wait. The fees are all justified and they all work out. We're going to come back to that. But to your original question of like, how do I discern like what's going to be the right investment? I want to know like, what is the role you want to play? So are you, are you looking to be client facing? Like, do you want to be out building key relationships in the community or even interacting directly with your customer? Or do you want to be managing through a team of people? Managing through a team of people. Because the people that listen to this podcast are all like, leaders business owners and leaders so i'm just trying to position right. myself to, yeah okay, okay go ahead. so you want to lead teams of people so what kinds of people there are franchise businesses that require minimum wage people which some people feel awesome about hiring sometimes we have businesses like a day spa where you have nurse practitioners and estheticians trade skill people who are super passionate about their job you know, and then there are businesses that require a genuine, like a, a trade, like an electrician or a plumber. And so there's all different types of employees. So we have to think about like, as an owner in the business, building that camaraderie among your team, right? Getting, getting everybody rowing in the boat in the same direction and, and keeping that momentum going. What kind of people are you going to be effective at leading? So who do you want to create jobs for? It's really important. When you're at work and you are, you're, you, when we look at scaling a business, we're always scaling a business in one of three ways, using people, human capital, using equipment, or using brick and mortar physical location. So as an owner, do you want to be ma- hiring and hiring and hiring to grow? Do you want to be adding on more trucks where you're looking at revenue per truck? Like, let's say that you had like a, a 1-800-GOT-JUNK franchise, right? So it's about revenue per truck or a pest control business like mosquito spraying. You probably don't have mosquitoes in Vegas, but over here in New England, right. we got mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, or, or if you'd some, maybe you're into fitness and you're like, okay, I really want to own the next Orange Theory. So, you know, and let's say that we get, we break all the, the financials out and you realize one location can do a million dollars in top line and that nets to the owner 200 grand. 
but you want to make 600 grand. So you need three of them. So then we're looking at multiplying, you know, the real estate times three. What What so, are some of like the better franchises for owner revenue? Like you said, Orange Theory, let's say it's 200 grand. How much is like a Menchie's? Oh, I'm not making any earnings claims. Oh, that's not a real thing? Okay. okay. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I, It's not my job to ever, ever make... If a franchise consultant is ever making an earnings claim to you, please fire your consultant. So we are middlemen. I'm like eHarmony. But do you have like an... This, but you have a... a dating but do you have like a ballpark? But, well, you know, in general, if you were to go to, to business school or go get an MBA, right, they're going to teach you the basics about a business. So I think okay. it's a reasonable expectation. This is not an earnings claim, people. Right. It's a reasonable expectation in a business that all businesses are going to net out somewhere between 10 and 20%. Now, some can be lower like Walmart, right? That's volume, but very, very low margin. Some can be higher get to where you get 20 or 30%. Sometimes in the same franchise, you have owners who are at 10 or 12% and other people who are at 18 or 20% just based on how efficient of an operator they are, which is why going back to fees, Richie, franchisors are taking that royalty off of gross revenue, not the net, because they can't control how efficient of an operator you are. But what they can help to control is driving that revenue by having marketing and national accounts and in ways for you to keep growing your revenue. And that's why they get a percentage of that gross revenue. So it's not net, not after expenses. It's how much did you total bring in for the year? And they take the right. percentage of that? They, uh, per month. And the national average on that royalty is between six and 10%. So of gross sales. So franchisors make money from royalty. And, and like, there's this thing out there, like people begrudge the franchisor the opportunity to- I mean, they have a lot like, to I deal know, with. No, it's not a lot. Listen, listen, listen. Oh my God. So, so they, we, you can't expect the franchisor to be there to keep growing your opportunity, to keep look, you know, researching, staying ahead of the competition keeping you on the cutting edge so that you're remaining relevant to the changing consumer demands, that costs money. Where do they make that money? They make that money from franchisees. Right. So they make money because they teach you how to make money. You make money and then they make money. Right. So when, you, when you're tripping over fees, first of all, the number one thing you got to do is go talk to the people who are paying the fees. If the other people are out there living the dream, knowing what they know now, they would do it again, even after paying all the fees, then probably you're going to figure out that the fees are justified. The other way that you justify the fee is you ask yourself, let's say the, the, the royalty is 7%. So ask yourself this, after you understand everything the franchisor has created, the business plan, the technology, the proven marketing, the call center, the whatever. Right. All this, right. this process. So you ask yourself this question. Do I believe that by being a part of this franchise with everything that they've created, that I can make 7% more than if I was to try to go out and recreate this on my own without them? Job. <laughs> right. 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 The royalty, the reason that people trip over it is they're comparing the revenue of mom and pop businesses where you're right, you probably can't give away 7%. But like, let's say that in a franchise, you're in a home services franchise and the franchisor says our average first year revenue is a million dollars. So you're going from zero to seven figures in your first 12 months if you're average. Like if you were to, and let's say it's a trade business like plumbing or HVAC, and you were to go out and you were to compare that to buying a, a mom and pop HVAC company, right? Where the guy that owns the business is the HVAC guy. He has no scale. He can't figure out how to do 150 grand a year at 6% margin. So right. that's where that misconception comes from is people aren't fully understanding the leverage that you have in a franchise when you're working on it and not in it, when you're driving revenue every day, not being a, a wrench turner, right? Or a yoga instructor or whatever the business does right? Where you're the owner leading teams of people driving revenue and you have much greater opportunity to drive significantly bigger businesses. Do you, now do you consult people 
So let's just say, for example, I, I bought a munchies because I love munchies, frozen yogurt. Um, and now the way the way that it's like it's set up should be I purchased the franchise. They give me access to everything, right? The marketing, the training, all that stuff. And from then I could hire someone, a manager, hire the people and never step foot in there. Is that realistically possible or is um, it? Or is it in the beginning, you know, like you said, working on the business versus in it, like I'm not going to be sitting there measuring the ounces of this cup of ice cream. I'm going to be, you know what I mean? Is that like, how does that work? Is that a real yeah. thing or is that, am I stretching? Yeah, I would say that in the beginning, it's an unrealistic expectation that an owner is going to put, you know, let's just say on average in a business like Menchie's 350 to a half a million into the build out of a location and then never step foot in it. And it's also unrealistic that the franchisor would award you that opportunity. Um, maybe not on, maybe by your 10th one when you're proven, but not on your first one when you're unproven because they don't want a failure on their hands. They have to disclose so they expect that in their- you. Yeah, so they yeah. expect you to say, "Hey, you're if you buy this franchise, you know, you're going to be in there, you're going to be managing, you're going to be moving this along. You can't just take all the processes and systems, hire the right people, manage, you know, somebody at the top to make sure everyone else is doing it correctly and and that's it. Like they won't well, let that can. happen." Well, you can. No, no, no. You can totally do that. That's called semi absentee ownership. But the question I would say to you, if you were asking me, can I do that? I would be like, I don't know. Can you? Because the franchisor may approve that, but can you do it? Can you leave your half a million dollar investment in the hands of somebody you just hired from a, you know, from a, a website, like on recruiting, you know, but a lot of times right. franchisors are looking for higher level executive people that want to build bigger businesses. So they can't be in on the ground floor of every location or territory. And they're willing to even help you hire that manager because that's the person they're going to be training and working with. So they want to find somebody that they can work with who they know will be successful as your manager. So, and, or then sometimes you'll hire that person, but then that person will go to training with you because they're the ones that are actually going to be, you know, employing the, the tools and tactics that are learned. So every franchise does it a little bit different. And again, this is why I have a business to help discern what's important to you and then to make sure that your expectations align with the particular companies that we're looking at and that the support that's being offered by the franchisor aligns with the support that you are looking for yeah yeah no it's interesting i mean i, I always wondered like how how exactly that worked and what they would and wouldn't allow somebody to do um so how, how do you get approved for a franchise is it like a long drawn out process or you know let's, let's say okay i wanted to buy a franchise and i picked orange theory like how long would it take me to you know let's say we don't have to do a build out let's say there was another gym in a you know what's another one of them f45 let's say there was an f45 location and they closed down so they're now allowing an orange theory. So we don't have to do any build outs or anything like that. We, you know, you, you obviously have to put the equipment and some build out, but you don't have to get permits for plumbing and stuff like that. Right. So what would the, how long would that take to get the ball rolling? All right. So it's two separate questions. The first question, which is the part I'm a part of getting you to the yes, being awarded. I love that you asked that question. Franchises are not sold. They are awarded. At least the good ones are to people that, again, the franchisor believes is financially qualified, is motivated, has the right skill set to be a leader in their organization. Um, and that process takes about one to two months when you're working with wow. someone like Kim Daly. Yep. I can have, like, I'm starting with people now at the time of this recording, it's early December. We're looking, those people are probably decision makers by the end of January, the 1st of February. So it's a one to a two month process. You know why, Richie? Because- there's about four to six steps to go through, and it's about one step per week that ultimately leads you to the Discovery Day event, which is where you get to go out to the corporate office, experience the workout, or walk through a corporate store, or taste the product, even though I don't really do food. Um, so you get to be immersed in the culture of the franchise for 24 hours and be in front of the leadership and the operations people, because ultimately what you're buying 
is this relationship? So we do all the logical due diligence at home to dot our I's and cross our T's. And then we go out and I say, we sprinkle in the emotion because it's some part emotion to saying yes to a business. This is not purely transactional. This is about being in business with other people. So we have to go meet the people and make sure they feel like people that we believe in, that we believe we can be mentored and coached by. And for the franchisor, they want to meet you because they want to make sure that you're coachable, right? They don't want to award somebody a franchise that's going to be like, you know, butting heads with them at every turn. Right. So there's that one to two months. And then from there, that's you signing your franchise agreement. And now you're officially an owner. If you have a business that doesn't require a brick and mortar build out, I'm not going to go so much with the example you gave, but let's say you have a more like a home services business that's more territory based, like 1-800-GOT-JUNK or mosquito spraying or home cleaning or something like that. So those typically can be, I'd say 90 days on average. I mean, again, I don't want to make any claim. Every business is a little different. Sometimes from signing to opening is as little as 30 days, but I'd say on average, you have to order a truck or wait for equipment. You have to go through training. You might need a license of some, of some kind. So it's typically more like, I'd say two to four months in a non brick and mortar business. If you are getting involved in something where you need a physical location um, and you're not doing a conversion like Richie set up. That's somewhere usually between six and 12 months from signing. Wow. To but you, yeah. Mm. You, but you would know all of this before you say yes. Right. I mean, this is right. part of your due diligence. Right. So and for so, some people, it's part of why they pick a business because sometimes right. people are in transition and they're like, I don't, I don't want to wait a year for a build out. So I'm going to buy a business where I don't have to wait for that now. And then while I get this one up and going, I'll come back and look at a second franchise. And now I have the lead time to get into that long before I actually need it to be cash flowing. Got it. And now I know, I know a lot of the answer to this question has to do with the operator, how good the operator is. However, <clears throat> what is like, if you were to look at the, the, the franchises out there right now, and none of them are going to hold you to this. So don't worry. What are some of like the top margin franchises today that you're seeing people get the the best margins from like what are like realistically because some people are going to come to you and say here's my passions i don't care about the margins i i'll I'll, you know i'll make i understand i can make pretty good money and i want to stick with my passion or you know and then there's some people that are like i'm a business person i just love running businesses i don't care what it is um but i'm looking for the best opportunity for the thickest margins how would you respond to that? Like what would be some of the options that you would say? So this is really why Kim Daly doesn't really focus on food or brick and mortar retail business, because that doesn't mean I don't like brick and mortar. I like brick and mortar wrapped in service. So I am the queen of low fixed costs, high margin, reoccurring businesses. That is my sweet spot in life. So So that would be um, like orange theories and stuff, right? It could be that. It could be, again, it could be something like mosquito spraying because- you know, mosquitoes come back every two or three weeks. And it's so I like that reoccurring revenue. I like the low fix. I like the low fix cost because it means that even if no one's walking in, I'm not bleeding to keep my doors open. I like uh, boutique fitness because it's wrapped in a smaller membership to break even. So sometimes in some of the franchises I work with, you can open your doors with your break-even membership. If your break-even membership is only 200 people and you start selling your, you know, your founding members during construction of your location, then you may open with 200 members quite easily. And so now you're opening from day one with cash flow, which absolutely helps people stomach investments. Right. Right. If you, if it takes you a year just to get to the break-even, right, that's a very long time to cover a business. And most of the business you need up money that you need up front then is working capital and you feel right because like you're, you're every month so let's say so let's use like mosquitoes or pest pesticide or whatever this is similar to like a a, a brick and mortar f- fitness for example because there's a monthly they usually pay monthly for it right but there's no there's no brick and mortar costs 
you're you're paying people that work from home, Trucks, I assume. Call centers. Yeah. Right. You still have expenses. Yeah. No, for sure, for sure. But you don't have the the brick and mortar aspect yeah, you're not of it, signing which is right. Right. I mean, call centers today. I mean, pretty pretty virtual, right? I mean, they could be. So, yep. well, so is that what you're saying? To like, if you were to look at margins alone, those kind of businesses, home services, um, are are. Well, yeah, well, that's Go going ahead. to be a lower investment business that allows people to tiptoe in, right? Because you're going to like look what, at what's an example of a sorry, let me just interrupt you. But what's, what's an example of an investment into something like that ballpark? <laughs> I don't give investment ranges, but I would say that it's it's close or around. I, I don't even want to say it because it's not my job to do that. It's other people. My job is to lead people to the I information see. See. and then let the franchisor really help you understand how their unit economics work. What does it cost to open this and how much money can I make? But where I was going to the original question you asked is in a lot of these businesses where you have fixed or controllable fixed costs, then you can get to that fixed cost and then you can continue to drive membership or drive clients beyond that. And guess what happens to your bottom line? Your fixed costs stayed the same. But what happens right. is maybe you start out at a 20% net margin and then you get past your break even, your fixed expenses, and now it starts to go to 25 or 30 or even 40%. So on a million dollars in top line revenue, if you're right at your fixed costs every month, you're only clearing 20%, 200. But if you can go to 800 memberships, let's say, maybe you can get to where you're you're taking home from that same investment, you know, 400 grand. So, right. but is isn't that hard in a isn't that hard in a brick and mortar when you're limited by space? Like you, you, you no. there's a, there's a, isn't there a max capacity? I can't have any more than in this space 300 members or something. Uh, no, because the reality is like, I mean, look at Orange Theory Fitness or Cycle Bar where people are signing up to go to class. You know, yeah, it's a pain in the butt when you're a member and you want to sign up and you forget yeah. and you can't get to class because every seat is taken or every treadmill is taken. Right. But as an owner in that business, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> and right. therein lies that I own all six of them in the area. So if you can't get into class here, you can drive two miles down the road and you can go there. You know, so oh, I see. Yeah. you can be shifting your members and your trainers around and still capture all of that market and make sure that you have a treadmill or a bike for anybody. So, you know, again, it comes back to what people are trying to create, what they're what they want to do to create that. If we go to the other extreme of like my laundromat, I mean, these are businesses where you're, you know, less than five hours a week by the owner and the thing just mints money because right. a laundromat works. People are think, who goes to a laundromat? Well, you got to get into the investigation and understand how their real estate team works in terms of demographically sort, you know, finding the pockets in a community where people use laundromats. And, and that's why you do this with a franchisor. And, and then you just build it and the people come. Yeah. I was thinking, um, I always thought like tanning salon would be such a good, you know, if you could have it where it was turnkey, where they have like a fob and they can go into their own bed. Like you don't need somebody actively there, but wanted, you know, to come in. Well, I guess you'd have to have someone to clean. I forgot about that yeah. piece. But. And tanning is regulated now by the, uh, by the FDA. Like you have to be over a certain age. And so that's why they have oh, that. Oh, wow. There. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. You can't just walk. If you're under like 18 or 21, because of the risk of skin cancer, they, they like control that massively. And tanning is even taxed. So I, I like the tanning business too, again, because it's controllable fixed costs and reoccurring revenue. And the people that are going to tan are going to tan regardless of concerns for cancer. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. So where do you see like the franchise, like how many franchise opportunities are there today? Like if you had to, how many yeah, franchises so are there in the U.S.? This is why it's a daunting task if you're out there on your own. At any one time, it said that there are between three and 4,000 businesses Holy operating smokes. as franchises. Yeah. How do you even know where to begin? How do you know what's yeah. the right, the, the right, the best franchisor in a space? You don't. You work with someone like me that has 20 years of relationships and knowledge right, of who's right. who and what's what. And the other factor can, to consider is where in the life cycle of the brand do you want to be inserted? Some people are pioneering and they want to come in riding 
that brand and driving it to its market potential. That's the best position if you're looking for an exit strategy in seven to 10 years. Like imagine if you got to be one of the founding fathers of Planet Fitness. I know we keep talking about fitness, but everybody knows these brands. There's many other brands though like that. But like, so a brand like that, that's going to ride a wave up once the whole world wakes up and everybody's like, wow, what is this thing? I want one. And there's no more good locations. That's where you have the best brand equity and where people cash out for big, fat, healthy multiples, right? Mm. But for some people, they don't have the, the risk tolerance because what if it doesn't go on like that, right? And they, they want something that's a little slower and steadier, not going to have a peak, but not going to have a valley. Again, something like laundry or hair salon or something that just in good times and bad, people are investing money in automotive. And so these businesses might not have those big, sexy exit strategies, but they also might not be as, you know, cause as, you know, uh, heart palpitations for the owner. They're just a little bit slower and steadier and have a little more sustainability to them. So these are the kind of conversations I'm having with my candidates before we match opportunity to make sure that I'm putting you into uh, opportunities in front of you that match the investor that you want to be at this moment in your life. I love it. I love it. So, um, you know, you've been doing this for 20 years. What's, what's your next play? Like what, as a consultant, um, I, I'm assuming you work for yourself or do you, do you have like a bro? Is it, cause it's kind of like a real estate agent almost. It's like, you're, you're this consultant and then you match somebody who's interested in a franchise with the franchise or right. Yeah. And then do, do you work, do you have your, do you work for yourself as a consultant or do you work for a consultancy type agency? Yeah, so get this. I'm like a franchisee of a company. That does really other people. <laughs> yes. No way. That's so funny. yes, I work for myself, but yes, I pay royalties. And yes, I'm trained and supported by a corporate office for 20 years, right? What's so, the name of it? What's the name of it? Oh, it's called Fran Choice. We help people make that is so choice. funny. Oh my God. There's a franchise yep. for everything, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. But I do business as the daily coach. So to your question of what's next for me. So I've been very, very blessed by this opportunity. I've been doing this for 20 years. Like who knew when I started that this would be the greatest thing that ever happened to Kim Daly. Um, About 10 years ago, I built the largest franchise consulting business in the history of franchise consulting. I kind of broke free from the pack by changing some of my mentality and getting- Yeah, your messaging is on point. I'm sorry, but like- most people in, in your position are definitely message messaging around franchises where your messaging is more about helping people build wealth and find their path and mindset. And, like it's way better. So good for you. Okay, go, go ahead, continue. Well, you know what, Richie? So all I'm doing is what I've learned to do for myself. As I've grown as an investor and a business owner, it allows me to be a better coach to other people. So You know, when I spent eight years as an average performing franchisee, and then I became a history making franchisee over 10 years ago, and I've spent the last decade breaking my own history records, like again and again and again, and maybe even again this year, 16 more weeks until we'll find out. How many more do you need? (laughs) Right? Okay. No, How many more places in my pipeline? Everything that I can control for this year is done. Like it's my I business see. is not one where I can control. You're everything. just seeing I if just, people accept or. Yeah, there's okay. a lot of people right. I have like going to discovery days and being approved and then deciding whether they'll move forward or not. But I, it's not. This is the way I look at what I do. I give to the measure that I give, then I receive, and so I end up receiving uh, awesome amounts because I give a lot. I. You know, I just drive a lot of prospecting. I'm, I spend a lot of money and time figuring out how to reach more people, how to, you know, how to make my message resonate with people. Yeah. And, um, and so, but here's what I was going to say. You asked me what's next for me. So I, I'll always be a part of Franchise. I love this business. I was really born to do this. I yeah. feel like just I looking. want to grow something to where I can actually generate leads for other consultants and, you know, take my business to a whole nother level of production, um, which is why I'm partnered with the same company that you're partnered with to kind of help me create ways to scale what I do. Uh, But I have teenage boys and I think that, um, 
if they follow their mom, they will not be corporately employed. If they don't choose to be, I think that <laughs> right. there is a very good reality that I will be investing in franchises with my children. Well, um, that's cool. I do believe in it. Yeah. Can I offer one thing that I thought about before we spoke? And and even when I was, you know, your bio and everything like that is, and I didn't learn this till the very end, which is that you are also a franchisee. And you've worked your way to the top and have done it for 10 years. Yeah. Can I ask that you put that in your intro and in your bio? Because it's so powerful. And it's, if it, it really like, I don't know why I'm having this conversation on the podcast. And maybe you're I like, oh, I have reasons why I don't do this. I just feel like the validity of what you, you didn't, you don't have to have that because when you start speaking, you know what you're talking about. Exactly. But it adds that extra layer where <laughs> I would have been like, you know what I'm saying? Though? I don't know. So, but that's exactly but, why I don't say it, Richie. I just feel like really what, <laughs> but but it gives you the, it, it just is like, it elevates everything that's you, nice. do you know what I mean? Like if I, if I'm like, okay, not only does she help people find their dream franchise and connect them with it and make sure it's the right fit, but she did that for herself. And then, yeah. and not only became a franchisee, but was at the top of the game breaking breaking records for a decade. People are going to be like, yeah. what? You know what I mean? I don't know. Anyways. Well, when people work with me, I do share my story because not, not because I think they're interested in my story, but because it helps me coach. Because there's this thing about franchising. I'm going to go find people that are, are struggling when I, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I have time to talk to owners. I'm like, really? What are people who are struggling going to do for you? Right. Like they, right. The people are looking to make it wrong. And I'm going to, so I tell my story, like I, I was eight years average performing and then I was history making. So I'm the same me. Brand choice was the same process, but I, but I created two very different realities. So when you're talking to other franchise owners about where they are at that moment in their business, their responses are based on where they are at that moment in their business. It's the truth they have today, but it might not be the truth they have tomorrow. And you're not investing in the business for where it is right now. You're investing in the business for where it's going. So the reality is you need to get to the people that have figured it out to the max that it is today. But there are other consultants that have come to me, asked me, I want to do what you do. One guy doubled what I did one year. I mean, I, I loved him and I hated him all at the same time, but it right. was, he was like, Kim, I couldn't have done it without you. You're the one who created the mindset that this was possible. So, but at any one time, anybody could break free from the pack because they want it, because they figure something out, right. because they put their head down and just drive that activity that is necessary to create a certain outcome. So I don't go bragging about what I did. I, I, I'll share with you what I'm doing which has created this result for me. And I think it can create the result for you too. But ultimately I want people to embrace ownership, which means owning it when it's awesome, but it also means owning it when it's not good. Right. Right. right? No, it's super true. No, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. This was really good. So listen, for everyone out there that's listening right now, whether you want a franchise or um, you might want to help people get franchises, uh, definitely, definitely reach out to Kim. So Kim, what's the best way to, to connect with you and find you? Uh, awesome. Awesome question, Richie. So please go to my YouTube channel, which is my, my name, Kim Daly, D-A-L-Y, kimdaily.tv. Type that in your browser. I have nearly 500 videos on all subjects, franchising, business ownership, mindset, coaching, interviews with top performing franchisors and franchisees. It's an amazing, amazing resource to learn more, to, to understand my philosophies and thoughts on ownership. And if from there you're excited to begin your journey, again, it's free. Of course, all of my contact information to all of my forms is found right there on my YouTube channel. And I'd be happy to um, speak with you. You will not work with a junior associate. I work with every single person that reaches out to me. So please feel free to reach out if you're interested. Yeah, no junior associates. We want no to talk junior. to Kim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kim, thank you so much for uh, your time being on the show and answering all of my um, obnoxious questions. I loved it, Richie. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me today. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Play Podcast. 
If you liked the show, make sure to leave us a review. For more resources, visit RelentlessUniversity.com or download the free Relentless University app. And if you're interested in having me speak at your next event, visit RelentlessRitchie.com. Until next time.